Welcome to the FSF and Tapestry podcast. I'm Helen Edwards and this week my guests are HMI Phil Mins and HMI Wendy Ratcliffe. Phil is Ofsted's specialist advisor for early years and primary education and Wendy's work in Ofsted is focused on early years inspection policy. With the revised EYFS becoming statutory from September 2021 and the early adopter year very nearly over, I wanted to clarify some questions raised in the early years community around curriculum design, observations and assessments, what inspectors are likely to focus on, and what is required around documentation in terms of your school or settings curriculum map, if you have one at all. We also discuss progression skills and how we can ensure all our children make good progress in their learning and development without recording unnecessary tracking information. Welcome, Phil and Wendy. It's great to have you here today. So um, I, I wanted to start with, um, with a quote from the inspection, inspecting the curriculum um, a document from May 2019, where the quote is, inspectors and leaders start with a top level view of the school's curriculum, exploring what's on offer to whom and when, and leaders' understanding of curriculum intent and sequencing. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of how would you expect a teacher to give you written evidence for this, for example? And is this the same as a list of progression skills or is that something completely different? Perhaps you could both talk, talk us through that. So shall I, shall I start and start with that one? And I think something really key there just to pick out is the fact that um, how would you expect a teacher to give you written evidence for this. I think that's a really important place to start because actually there is no requirement for written evidence um, in terms of inspecting the curriculum. I don't know, Phil, do you want to you add? Yeah, I mean, and it's, and it's interesting sort of that idea of um, a teacher giving written evidence. Often mm. what we'll be doing in the early years is we'll be having conversations so we'll be talking to um, the teacher or the leader or the staff in there about um, what children are learning, what they need to learn next, what they, you know, why you've decided to do what you're doing today, um, why is this helping them on their journey, and it's that conversation that mm-hmm. is going to help us to understand, um, you know, how how everything is working, and that's how we'll be operating a lot of the time. I mean, in a school. Prior to that, we will have had conversations with subject leaders, head teachers, other people to understand, if you like, the sort of the shape of things, how, you know, the sort of the, the overview, if you like. But when we're actually sort of in those classrooms, what we're often interested in is, um, you know, talk to us about what's going on, explain mm. it to us, help us to understand it. Mm. So, and we wouldn't be expecting to have anything written and there is no expectation on any sort of written evidence or um, planning or anything available to us during an inspection. And I think it's, and that there's a section in both both the handbooks. There's a, a section in both the um, Registered Early Years Handbook and also in the um, Handbook for Schools um, to kind of, it sets that out that there isn't any expectation that things need to be in a particular written format. So if you didn't get what was required orally from the people you're talking to, what would an inspector do then? Is, is that the time they would say, can you expand on something? Have you got anything written down? Or is that still not even at that point? You, you, once you've made your judgment that actually the staff can't describe their curriculum with any depth or um, obvious knowledge around progression or whatever, what what happens then? Yeah, it's um, it, it really depends on the situation I suppose Mm. I mean it's um what we would always do is pursue things we're interested to understand more so if people say oh yeah you know um we did this work recently on um oh I don't know the Gruffalo we might say oh can can we see some of that or we might go and see some children and talk to some children about it um you know um We were in a nursery, I would say recently, but it wasn't recently at all because it was obviously (laughs) pre-pandemic. So the timescales have gone out the window. But we were talking, we'd spoken to some staff in that place and they were explaining to us how they really wanted children to understand books and really get into the story. And they talked to us about how they'd previously done, I think it was um, 
Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Yeah, that's right. So they talked to us about Goldilocks and they said they did, you know, they told the story. They set up these situations where children were reenacting the story. They set up something outside. They did all this stuff. And then later in the day, um, I was having a conversation to some children who were actually working on the Gruffalo. And I I asked about other stories they liked and they started to tell me about Goldilocks and Three Bears. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'd heard that piece of information earlier on about something that they'd done. And then you sort of pursue it in, in a different mm-hmm. way. And we're always trying to see that information from different points of view so that we can really, you know, we come in, um, uh, you know, um, based on the idea that everyone's going to tell us um, what's going on and that we're just interested in finding out more about it and seeing how effective that stuff is. And I think there's, uh, you know, there's another example where I've I've been in a nursery and, um, you know, talking to, to the, you know, deputy about the curriculum for physical development, for example. And actually, we were, we were in the two to three year old room and talking about what is it that you want your children to be able to do in this room to be ready before they move into the next room. And there was lots of discussion around, you know, um, those independent, you know, being independent, being able to put your own coat on, being able to use the toilet um, and and how they go about that. And, and with that, a child rushes in from outside and throws their coat on the floor into the toilet, member of staff behind them, then sort of like says, you, oh, so and so, have you remembered to wash your hands? And then as they come out, they then don't forget to put your coat back on. And, you know, they, they put, do that thing, flip thing, put their arms mm, in, yeah. flip the coat on. And actually that's evidence of learning. So, you know, yeah. that deputy said, this is what we want our children to be able to do before they're ready to move into the next room. And actually in front of my eyes, there's a child demonstrating that they're able to do that. That's really helpful to give, to give examples. Thanks very much. If we think about a reception teacher now, is there any expectation that he or she would know how the curriculum develops into Key Stage 1 and 2? I'm seeing quite a number of reception teachers writing geography plans to kind of explain to the subject leaders further up the school what geography looks like in a reception class. Is there any expectation around that kind of work? I think that's a, it's a really interesting point that you raise, and one that we're very clear, um, we're very keen to sort of clarify for people. Um, the you know the requirements, the statutory requirements set down that children in the early years foundation stage should receive the seven areas of learning. That is their curriculum, um, in exactly the same way that a child older, further up in a school would re- would um, is entitled to receive all of the areas of learning in the national curriculum. So there is no requirement on schools to provide geography lessons in um, the early years what they need to be doing is covering everything you know that's that's covered within the seven areas of learning um, having said that we know that children will be learning about geographical things in the early years very very clearly and you know when we go into schools often we'll be having a conversation um, you know say for example in the school there is a, um, a deep dive going on in science in the reception class or in the nursery class, we'd be looking, we'd be interested in the sort of scientific learning that's going on for children within, you know, and that could be within their their physical development, it could be within their communication and language, literacy, wherever it is, we'd be interested in that and some of the things that are going on for those children that are providing them with that sort of broad, broad knowledge that they would want to acquire as they're traveling through the early years. So there's not that sort of specific link um, and obviously, also in the early years, um, you know, which is really reflected in the in the new EYFS, particularly that's starting from September, this idea about sort of communication, language, and vocabulary being across everything, and that importance of talk. Now, that would be one of the things that we'd be, again, really interested in. We're not going to um, sort of constrain learning in the early years by thinking about it in terms of a subject which appears later on. Because learning, if say, going back to my science idea, children can be learning about science all over the place. So that's mm-hmm. not going to be constrained or confined to one particular, you know, 30-minute slot in a day. Um, children will be learning about that when they're, when, they're, when they're doing the weather first thing in the morning, if they're talking about, you know, what happened at home last night, what, you know, all sorts of places. And then there might be some specific activities going on that have got a sort of sciencey feel to them. But really, we wouldn't want the curriculum to be narrowed in that way in the early years um so no there's no sort of requirement on people to to do that i think sometimes 
um, there's there's a sort of top down view almost of the curriculum as if you know we want we want children to do well in science in key stage two so therefore in the early years they need to be doing science um, and that's not really how subjects work is it you know we sort mm. of subjects come out of that sort of broad I always think it's a bit like a tree you know that everything when you've got babies everything is together all the learning happens together in that sort of big trunk and then it's only as children grow and develop and learn that those subjects sort of split off into their into their branches you know whether that's through seven areas of learning and then later on into to separate subjects so that's where we would see that that broad base of learning taking place and of course the, the importance we can't underestimate the importance of vocabulary and that's the key to everything in the early years you know the more children can talk about and learn about things and store all of that knowledge up then that helps them so much um, in their later learning so um, I don't know I might have wandered slightly off the point there but no, I think the answer really is helpful. no we don't expect to see geography yeah. No, no, we don't. And I think there's something else there as well. I think, you know, you know, inspectors are interested to have that discussion around, you know, the, the curriculum starts as, as soon as a child enters that enters into that school. So mm. it begins in the early years and, yeah, spans from there. And just yep. interested to, you know, h- how how does that work? Yeah, the, the early years is so important, isn't it? It's mm. such an important part of a child's learning. And if... Um, schools aren't really thinking about what children are learning in the early years and how that informs later on you know what they learn in key stage one and then on into key stage two then they're not really thinking about their curriculum in its full with its full potential Mm. and thinking Um, about how children are ready for what comes next mm. that makes perfect sense so the the number of schools that we're hearing about who are writing curriculum maps do you think they're they're starting at key stage two and seeing what children are being taught at that stage and then therefore what do they need to learn in key stage one to prepare them for that and therefore what do they need to be doing in EYFS to prepare them for that is that what you're seeing is happening or not yet I don't think we're I I think it's interesting there's a couple of things Mm. there about curriculum maps I mean there's there is no expectation from Ofsted to do any of that you know we're not going to expect to see that Um, you know it's entirely up to schools how they choose to to organise and plan the paperwork that they have in association with anything to do. What we're interested in is um, is how effective it is, you know, describe it to us, tell us if it's working, what things, what, what bits do you think are working well, what bits do you think could be a bit better? And that's what we'll be interested in when we're, when we're in there. I think, um, you know, a lot of our curriculum research that was, um, that was carried out to inform the EIF, you know, the inspection framework that we launched in September 2019, was looking at the curriculum and how the curriculum worked. And one of the interesting pieces of thinking there, we sort of, I can't remember the um, the correct name for it, but I was thinking about it as in terms of you don't run a marathon to run a marathon. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we think that in a primary school, the marathon that we want children to run is the, you know, the year six SATs, for example, if we think that the SATs are the indication of the breadth of knowledge that they've got by that stage, um, then the way that we get children to be able to do well in that marathon isn't by getting them to do the year six SATs every week, you know, mm-hmm. from the moment they set foot in the reception class until the moment they leave in year six, in the same way that if you wanted to run a marathon, I'm told, although I've never run one or, or actually wanted to, <laughs> apparently what you don't do is try and run a marathon every day for the six months before you run a marathon. You do a whole range of things like yoga, like swimming, like some running to get you ready to run that marathon. And I think that's what we would encourage schools to see. That's very much where our research is. You know, you look at the sort of the primary school in terms of the early years foundation stage, key stage one and key stage two, you've got three really, really important aspects, elements of a child's education. How does each one pull its weight in that big journey to get the child to do well when they when they leave? You know, so they're really ready to excel when they get into secondary school. And if you want children to you know have a have that sort of level of scientific knowledge, for example, in year six, there's stuff that's happening in the early years all over the place to help them prepare for that. It doesn't mean you need to do year six work. You do the work that you would do as a three or four year old. But if your vocabulary is being really developed, if you're being encouraged to think about things, hypothesize, you know, why do you think that happened? What's the difference between that and that? You know, all of those sorts of things, or just, 
you know, learning about dinosaurs and learning that some dinosaurs are other dinosaurs and learning the names of some dinosaurs, you know, that sort of stuff that children would be interested in, that really informs, you know, if you if you understand that some dinosaurs are other dinosaurs when you're in reception, for example, when you come across other animals who are carnivorous or um, omnivores or you're going to, oh, I remember, I know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like Tyrannosaurus rex or you know, it's all of that, those links, isn't it? So that knowledge, the more they acquire the knowledge. So, yeah, I think that's a that's a really good way, I think, of looking at the primary school is that idea that each part, you know, each section plays its part, but that, that doesn't look like, you know, the thing that you want children to do in year six, um, you don't get them to do it in year one because, mm. because it's, you know, that's not going to help them. And I think, you know, ultimately going back to that, the, the question you know do we do we want curriculum maps we've no idea where that that's come from mm. and you know that is definitely um, a myth we're keen to bust that's really helpful thank you if we think about assessments now moving on to assessments what sort of assessments do you think are useful for a staff member to make and are they different to any assessment information that the senior leadership team might want to see? I think um, we, we've had lots of questions around um, assessment um, as, you know, as we were, as we think about how, when we were developing um, EIF and also, you know, as the EYFS reforms um, come into play in September. Um, and I think there's some really important messages there around, you know, that whole industry that's developed around the assessment of young children. And actually, there's a need to remind ourselves what assessment is about. And actually it's about noticing what children know and can do. And it's not about producing data and evidence for an Ofsted inspection, for example. Um, it's gotta be useful in terms of whatever the system that's in place needs to be doing the right thing. And is it, um, is it allowing staff to help children in terms of you know taking them on that that journey that they need to go on to be ready for what comes next i think i think and just sort of, i don't I mean, there's a danger that i simply say again what wendy's just been saying <laughs> but um i think that what people I wonder if what people have done is they've started separating out assessment and thing that, thinking that assessment is something else or something separate from what we do all the time. You know, I need to do my assessments on that afternoon or whatever. And of course, the best assessments and also the most interesting conversations we have with staff. You know, when you get a teacher and you're actually stood there and you're discussing a child and, and that, that teacher is saying to them, you know, when he started, he couldn't do that. And we tried to do this and, you know, it didn't work and he still couldn't do it. So we tried this and then and then after that, you know, and you get that that conversation where people explain to you and what they're doing, they've got that real knowledge of the child. They've got the knowledge of what they want them to learn and they're bringing that together and they're being curious and they're really working and they're putting all of their brain power into trying to get that child to be able to do the thing they can't do. And they're trying different ways if it doesn't work. And that is the real, that's the key to the assessment, isn't it? It's actually the assessment is the teacher's engagement with the child and with the learning and that, that trying to make it work, you know, really trying um, to get it. And I think that is the most powerful piece of assessment. Um, and it's also the good thing about that is you don't necessarily need the same level. You don't need to put the same level of, of assessment into all children, do you? Because some children, you lay out that well-prepared activity because you've thought about what you want them to learn. You explain them what you want them to do. They engage in that. And actually they practice what you want them to learn whilst they're doing it. And you can see them and you think, oh yeah, that's, that's working. It's the ones where it's not. And that's where you then bring in that extra layer of assessment. Um, and anything that happens sort of in the moment, if you like, is whilst you're watching that child and think, oh no, they need a little bit more help. You know, I um, so you know, you want them to um to learn to ride a bike, for example, and you can see them wobbling a bit, and you go over and help them, and you just support them so that they stop wobbling and they get to practice. That that immediate response, that using that assessment information to immediately respond and help them, enables that child to cat to keep up with other mm -hmm. children in their learning. If we 
if we leave assessment to be something that we do at the end of the week or at the end of the month, we create a situation where some children, what we'll, that assessment will show us is that some children are behind. And then what we've got to do is help them catch up. And as soon as we're into catch up, that those children are behind. And actually yeah. what we really want, uh, we, you know, often what we'll see is really good early years practice where we're seeing it at its best is that whole keep up. I want them to do this. And so I'm doing it all the time. And I'm really helping those children to, to make sure that they really keep up with everybody else. You know, mm. I, we can see it quite easy. Um, often, the, perhaps the most easy place to see it sometimes is in the sort of phonic programs that we see, where people have got a really well put together phonic program. They know what they want children to be practicing. And if they're not quite, they haven't got quite the fluency that they want, the teacher wants, they give them a bit of extra support. And they keep them in that group. They don't let them fall behind others. They try to keep them there. And we think that sort of keeping up type practice happens, you know, can happen across the whole curriculum. Mm. That's so helpful to give some examples because, as we all know, staff are, are really frightened when they know Ofsted inspectors are coming in. And particularly in nurseries where you might have a large number of staff all with different experiences of child development knowledge and different levels of training. What you said there really nails it in terms of you're going to be asking staff tell me about this child what do you, and of course every member of staff can say something about all the children they work with so that's really um encouraging to hear that that's that's what you'd be looking for people knowing think, their children well and i think that you know that that answers that key question that are in you know to start our reports you know what's it like to be a child in this early year setting what's it like to be a pupil in this school yeah and that's yeah what inspection's about and I think, and it's interesting about inspection, and people, I, we know that people get nervous about inspection. Now, we've mm. all been on the other side of it as well, you know, mm. as teachers yeah. or head teachers or, you know, wherever we are. So we know what that is. But one thing that people need to remember is that inspections, you know, like teaching, is not a performance. You know, it's, mm. not, it's not about ha what happens on that one day or two days that the inspection takes place. What we're looking for on our inspection is the impact of what happens every day for those children. We want to know what it's like for those children over time. So actually what we're always doing is looking at, um, looking to see what things are always like. So which is why, you know, we'll always be telling people, you know, if, during an inspection, just to, to do what you would always do. Don't mm -hmm. try and make it different. Um, and, and also when we're looking for, you know, the, the impact, um, you know, people say, oh, well, we want our children to learn how to do this. And then we're looking to see whether we can see them being able to do that or being getting closer to being able to do it. You can't do that overnight. You know, if one of the things that in your place you really want children to do is be polite and caring to each other, the way you get children to be polite and caring to each other, if that's an important part of your curriculum, your PSED curriculum or whatever, the way you get that to do is by every day, every moment, expecting mm -hmm. children to be kind and polite to each other and supporting them if they can't do it. Mm -hmm. You don't, you can't achieve that overnight, you know, before the night before the, the, the <laughs> inspection decide, all right, we want them to be, it just won't work, will it? And that's, um, but that's the same for all of it. You know, if it's the same for all of the curriculum, particularly with young children. If you want children to, to, to learn and develop in that way, you need to be giving them constant reminders and reinsurance um, on what you want them to be able to do. And that, and that just goes back to that whole thing around, you know, do what you do every day, mm -hmm. have the confidence to do that, because actually, if you try and do something different, you know, the children quite often yeah. let us know that that's not what normally happens. They don't usually let us play with this. <laughs> I've had before, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. So we've talked quite a lot about what, what you require of a reception teacher or staff in a nursery. If we can um, pose the next question around senior leadership teams, what do you expect them to be able to tell you about pupil progress if it's not data, if it's not percentages and numbers and pretty graphs? Well, that's a, um, um, that's a really interesting question. And, and often, well, no, perhaps not often anymore, but there are some times um, on inspection, um, head teachers struggle to talk to us about the early years. Um, when we're having those early conversations. I think that's decreasing, but there was definitely a time when perhaps um, head teachers might be relying on their early years lead or the reception teacher to talk about the early years. And I, that has always worried me. It's, it's rather like, you know, some uh, a house builder who um, 
is building lots and lots of houses, but they have sort of outsourced the foundations to some other organization. And they never bother to look at the foundations. They never bother to check about the foundations for those houses. And then they have this issue where some of their houses aren't as stable as others. Um, and that's, you know, if that, if we've got a school that's not really looking at what children are learning in the foundation stage, then they are, you know, mm -hmm. they're not making the best solid foundations for those children's learning. Because as Wendy was saying earlier on, a child's learning starts when they enter the school. That's where the curriculum begins. Um, so often what we would be expecting um, is for head teachers and senior leaders to be able to talk to us about how well the curriculum is working for those children and what the impact of that is and how do they know you know they we won't look at schools internal data during inspections but but we're quite happy for schools to tell us what their data what their data is telling them and what they've done as a result mm -hmm. You know, so so schools, I mean, it's, we, we won't be looking at that data. But if schools are, and we understand that schools may well be carrying out a whole range of different assessments and collecting data for their own purposes. And if that's, you know, to make sure that their children do as well as they can, that's great. And that might be telling them about the effectiveness of aspects of their curriculum. It might be helping them to identify that actually perhaps in some places, the curriculum isn't as strong as it should be. So we're very interested in that sort of information. You know, the sort of analysis or identification that, that leaders might be making of places where things are working really well, places where it's not working so well, and what they're doing about it. That is of interest to us. And, and again, I suppose it's rather like when we're in the reception classroom or the nursery and we're talking to people about the children. Um, those conversations will show up a lot of um, the extent to which people know how well their children are doing or not. Mm -hmm. um, and it, again, in those situations, sometimes people will say, well, of course, we, we really worked on our maths last year and we really tried to do this and this and this. And that might be some, been something that we look for when we were going out into the school, you know, to, to see if we can see what we've been told, if that's, you know, being replicated. You know, for example, you know, we did a lot of work with our staff. We did a lot of staff training on um, some of the early elements of number. I mean, we know that people, you know, might be considering that in terms of the revised DYFS and that sort of change that's around the requirements in maths. You know, and then we'd be interested in talking to staff and seeing in classrooms if that's actually coming through and if we can see that. So it's not so much the data for us. It's more about how well leaders know how well their children are doing in terms of, you know, what, what parts of the curriculum are working particularly well and what might not be working so well. Does that so sort of make us... Yeah. Per perfect sense. What do you see as the role of observations now going forward? Hopefully we've, we've, we're moving away from I've got to do three observations on each child every week kind of practice that, that was very sad to see over the last few years. Do they still have a, um, a place in early years? Are they still useful to share information with parents, for example, or to share information between staff members? What, what do you see the role of observations now in the future? So, so I think that goes a bit back to the the kind of a quest, the, the assessment question, really, in terms of how do you know what it is that the children in your class setting um, know and can do and how you establish that. And if that is you find it's useful to do observations to establish that because you're noticing what children are doing, then, you know, whatever system you've got in place um, needs to work for you know it needs to be doing you need to be doing it for the right reason you need to be doing it because it makes a difference to the children it helps us to identify where children are at and where we need to take them next or it, it helps to um, for us to inf keep parents informed of you know children's progress for example so that they can support children's learning at home so there is no you know we know that there's there's certain myths out there that you know we ne we need to have five observations of a child doing I don't know, climbing up the stairs or, or whatever it might be before you can tick that bit off mm. on the tick list. Um, well, you know, that's, you know, do what do whatever system works for you because it, it it's of benefit to the children and it reduces staff workload. So as an inspection, you wouldn't ask for any observations. If a staff member offered you them, would you be interested in seeing them or, or is that we, not part of the inspection process either? 
no well we we would be um you know asking that member of staff to explain tell us about what you know those conversations you know Phil's already already said around you know tell me about that child what is it that he could do when he arrived with you where is he now and where are you taking him but actually I think there's something there that's key that you know if a member of staff then wants to because they get nervous they want to look at those written observations that they've done as part of their assessment of that child if they want to check something it's not a memory test yeah. inspection is not a memory test if they wanted to then by all means they can but we're just interested in you know what does it tell you about that child mm. we won't and we wouldn't be sick we wouldn't want to be looking at the um the assessment itself yeah and like wendy says there if somebody you know if you were talking to somebody and they would became a bit flustered then mm. there's absolutely no problem with them saying can i come back and tell you that later on Mm. You know, can I just go and have a look and check and then come back and tell you? We've got absolutely no problem with that at all. And or if, you know, you've had a conversation with someone and someone then thinks afterwards, well, actually, oh, I wish I'd said that. Well, mm. come and find us. Come and tell yeah. us. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. It's that heat yeah, of the uh, moment, isn't it? Kind of. Yeah. 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 We know the that. inspector's yeah. talking to me. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the one thing that I would say about observations, just to go back to that observation thing is, and I think this is part of you know there's been this perception that observations has have to take place and from from our point of view there's that's you know it's not not that at all what we're interested in is how how do you make sure those children do well just one note on the observations though is that sometimes people think that sort of observations are the only thing and yet um you need to consider what you want what you want your children to learn you know if what you want your children to learn is um to be able to climb the climbing frame, then yes, an observation works really, really well, doesn't it? Because you can stand there and watch them. You might want to be a bit close just in case they haven't quite <laughs> got it yet, but but you can stand and watch them. But if what you want them to be able to do is, um, uh, um, oh, I don't know, um, think about why something happens, that's really difficult to observe. Mm -hmm. The only way you can actually do that is by engaging with the child is by having that interaction with them, is talking to them about it and exploring what they think. And so it's just really important when we're thinking about assessment to think that observation may be one approach and it may be appropriate for some things. But if we only use observation to assess, we'll miss quite a lot of stuff that's going on inside a child's mind. And actually, of course, that that thinking, what they're thinking about, what they're, um, the, the level to which they can explain something is not observable unless we actually get in there and really talk to them and have something going on and you know. So that's and, that sort of that work with the child is also really important. Absolutely. And it goes back to what it says in the EYFS, doesn't it? In terms of assessment, you know, assessment shouldn't entail um, you know, excessive paperwork and prolonged breaks from children, you know, because we know that those those interactions are are so key. And as Phil says, there there are, you know, as yeah, observation might be part of your assessment, but actually engaging and interacting with children is also part of assessment. Thank you. If we think about the inspection process now, um, it's, it's fairly new to um, settings and schools and to inspectors, especially after the, the last year. So if we think about the next term or so, can you talk a little bit about how inspectors are trained? Because that's also another worry with teachers saying, oh, we had an inspector who asked for this, this, that and the other, even though they're not supposed to ask for this, that and the other. Can you talk, can you reassure us around the training that inspectors get and will they be um, told that they shouldn't ask for certain documents? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all, all of our inspectors are trained um, on a regular basis and trained, you know, there's more training ahead of um, um, a return, you know, inspection for, for, for September. Um, and yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the other thing, yes, all inspectors are trained, but I think the other thing that's really important here is that the inspection handbook is the is is that guide it's the handbook that inspectors use and sets out the inspection process and that's what inspectors use and it's there it's published there's no other secret you know stuff that we've got or inspectors have got that they use everything that's used is published in in the handbook and so if there is a question if a you know if if 
on inspection someone's not certain that actually you know should you be asking for that well ask ask the inspector mm. Mm. definitely i mean that's why that stuff is published is so that mm. you can have a so that you know anybody yeah, who's that being professional inspected, dialogue yeah can read it the same as an inspector can and yeah and have those conversations as wendy says you know say well why are you asking me for that when in the handbook it says that you won't ask me for that that's really helpful to know that you can raise your concerns at the time. I know a lot of settings kind of suffer the inspection and then the inspector leaves and then they blurt out, you know, amongst themselves or on social media, they ask for this, that and the other. And it's too late at that point, really. They, so your advice is to deal with it as it's there, happening. Absolutely. And I, I think there is something else, though. There is also something about, you know, there will be um, particular um, you know, in a in an early years inspection, for example, a particular area of focus that actually an inspector may ask to see a particular piece of paperwork that is a requirement of the EYFS, for example, because it's a particular thing they're following through on because they're curious about, you know, their, that professional curiosity or it's something that needs to be followed up. Or, and it may be that, you know, on the inspection that takes place down the road, you know, a week later, they may not ask for that. You know, so it's not mm. always the same things that an inspector may be pursuing in terms of, you know, a particular piece of paper. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, our final question is really around what you've noticed this last year and um, from the early adopters year. Um, there's a really wonderful Facebook group uh, set up by a group of early adopters. I'm sure you're aware of very helpful, supportive network, and they're all sharing information about how the year's gone. What, what's your view of, of how this has gone for the early adopter year, and what lessons can we learn for, for next term and on into the future? I think uh, I think it's a really interesting year. Um, and, you know, people that we've been speaking to, the early adopters, many of them have been enthusiastic about some of the changes that have been that they've been able to put in place but equally um very aware of the challenges that they've faced because of everything else has been going on mm -hmm. over the last year so um i think some people have really sort of driven forward with that with the um with the reforms as early adopters and other schools have said you know we really haven't got anywhere near as far as we wanted to mm -hmm. um i think one of the things that we know from the from the various pieces of work that we've been doing over the past sort of 18 months, you know, since um, since COVID hit, we've done a variety of different pieces of work. In the early years, um, we, we carried on doing our regulatory work and we're visiting a lot of places in schools. We, we had a, a sort of a mixed approach. Um, what we know is that children in the early years have, um, have been affected quite significantly by, um, by COVID and that that settings and schools are really aware of that and doing their best to now try and sort of identify the gaps and do something about it. Um, and I think we've been, um, you know, impressed with the with the with the the work that people are doing to try and help those children to catch up. We we um, we did a series of phone calls during the autumn term out to providers, and there was some really interesting stuff that came back from that. And um, one person talking to us and saying. Um, what they realised when those children were coming back, because obviously they came back after the um, the first lockdown for a while, they said some of the children had forgotten some of the mm. things that they knew before. And so what we've been doing is really helping them to remember. Mm. And I thought that was a really nice way of putting it for those younger children, because ch young children need to practice a lot, don't they? They need to practice a lot to get to get to to be able to do things securely and know stuff securely, and to recognise that some children they, ha they it's not that they can't do it anymore. It's just they've forgotten. forgotten. And I think that's they've quite forgotten. a nice supportive mm -hmm. way of looking at them. Mm. There were really some lovely tales as well about how quickly children settled back into nursery and how they were really thrilled to be back there with their Excited. friends. Excited. Mm. And listening to stories and playing with toys and in the role play and so on. That, that was really, really lovely and refreshing to hear, wasn't it? When we thought many children have been traumatised, let's face it, um, to be able to go back to a a well-loved setting was was really what they needed at that mm. point with, with loving caring staff and, yeah. it, and it, it's interesting as well as you know some of those with some of those telephone calls some of the things that people were telling us about how they've had to think slightly differently about how they organized things you know still being 
still being clear about what it is they wanted children to learn, but actually knowing the, that they, you know, may have forgotten um, certain things. And, you know, the, there was one um, setting that was saying that they were doing more um, group work, more one-to-one in terms of that language and that vocabulary, because um, helping children to, you know, communicate with each other, um, because they'd, they'd kind of forgotten some of that. Mm. Mm. and some nice examples of how yeah helping children settle back in and and get back to where they were yes thank you so much for speaking to me today and I really really am convinced that that will help a large number of staff out in the early years particularly at the the end of this incredible year and preparing for September changes and so on there's a great deal of worry out there isn't there and and I'm absolutely sure your answers have I've gone uh, quite a long way into relieving those worries. It's been really lovely talking to you today. Thank you so much for your time.